Welcome to part one of our lecture series on facial recognition. Before we get going on this lecture, a note about OpenCV. The material presented here will require OpenCV version 3.3 or greater. So take a moment on both your laptop and your Raspberry Pi, enter into Python, import OpenCV, that's import CV2, and then confirm you have the proper version of OpenCV. If you happen to have an older version of OpenCV, click the link below for instructions on how to upgrade your OpenCV version. At its core, facial recognition is a mathematical representation of a face. And because we all have unique faces, we therefore have unique mathematical representations that define our facial features. The first person widely credited with using this mathematical approach was Woodrow Wilson Bledsoe in the 1960s. Bledsoe developed a system that could classify faces by hand, so this was a manual process, using a RAND tablet. This was a device where people would input the horizontal and vertical coordinates of certain facial features on a grid system. These metrics were then input to a database and then each time a new photograph could be compared with the information in the database. As you might imagine, one of the main limitations was the lack of computing power and the requirement then that these computations and comparisons be done by hand. Fast forward to the 1990s, we see that Sorovich and Kirby start to apply linear algebra to this problem of facial recognition. They developed what became known as the eigenface approach and showed that feature analysis on a collection of facial images could form a basic set of features. In fact, Sorovich and Kirby were the first to show that less than 100 features could be used to accurately code and identify a face. Turk and Pentland expanded upon this eigenface approach. They were the first to discover how to detect faces within images. This was effectively the first instance of what we would call automatic face recognition. In the 2000s, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, they developed the FERRET program. This was the Facial Recognition Technology Program. Within this program, DARPA and NIST developed a database that included high-resolution color images of some 800 people, resulting in a database with over 2,000 images. This was, at the time, the largest database of images for facial recognition. At the Super Bowl in Tampa, Florida, law enforcement officials used facial recognition in an attempt to detect criminals. However, this was seen largely as a failure due to the significant number of false positives that resulted from implementing this technology. In the 2000s, we also see the Face Recognition Grand Challenge. This challenge was open to researchers and developers with the specific intent to dramatically enhance and develop these facial recognition capabilities. In the last decade, we've seen a boom of facial recognition applications. For example, on a daily basis, over 350 million images are uploaded and tagged to Facebook each day. So Facebook has research teams dedicated to developing better and better algorithms, enabling capabilities such as auto-tagging of photos. The iPhone X was a huge breakthrough in terms of facial recognition technology, using facial recognition for security as the primary feature to unlock a user's phone. So this slide summarizes this historical perspective of facial recognition then. Early on, we're working with pen and paper. Everything was manually computed in the days of Bledsoe. We then get into the 90s with some limited computing power. And now, with more and more computing power available on smaller and smaller devices, facial recognition is booming. We're seeing dramatic developments in facial recognition capabilities. So how does facial recognition work? Well, let's take a look at one technique as an example. Here we'll review the histogram of oriented gradients, or the hog detection algorithm. As I mentioned, there are many techniques 
par cascades, deep learning, and other techniques available for facial recognition. But we'll take a look at the hog detector here. So first step is let's begin with the original image and then go ahead and convert that image to grayscale. Using this hog detector, we do not inherently need color in our images. That information is not inherently useful to the histogram of oriented gradients detection algorithm. Once we have our image in grayscale, we'll then go through one pixel at a time for the entire image. We'll take a look at the neighboring pixel. So the pixels surrounding the pixel under evaluation and we will evaluate in which direction are these surrounding pixels going from bright to dark. And for each pixel then, we'll draw an arrow and the arrow will signify again the gradient, right? The direction in which these neighboring or surrounding pixels are going from light to dark. If you repeat this process for every single pixel in the image, what happens is that you will replace each grayscale image with an arrow. These arrows then are the gradients, right? They show the flow or the direction going from bright to dark in terms of the grayscale images. So 0 to 255 for an 8-bit grayscale going from light to dark throughout the entire image. You're probably asking yourself, why bother going through this, right? This is a fairly computationally intensive process. Well, the reason is this. If we were to look at each pixel, dark images compared to light images would have different pixel values, right? There'd be a dependency on lighting. However, if we look at the direction or the gradient that the pixel brightness changes, we get the same representation for dark images and light images. So we effectively remove that dependency on ambient lighting. This makes the problem significantly easier to solve. Now, a means of helping with this intensive computation is instead of looking at each pixel, we break the image up into 16 by 16 pixel squares. In each square, we then go through, we count up how many gradients point in each of the major directions. So up, down, right, left, etc. And then we replace that square in the image with the dominant arrow direction. As a result, we have transformed the original image into a histogram, a histogram of oriented gradients. We've captured all the major information in the image, but we've achieved this by removing this dependency on the brightness of the image. Here at right is our original image, now converted to a histogram of oriented gradients. And the goal here is to detect the presence of a face in the image. So how do we do that? We start with a histogram of oriented gradients pattern. And this pattern was developed by comparing a large number of training faces. So a large number of images where someone went into the image, defined where the face was, and then pulled out the histogram of oriented gradients from that image. So here is our hog face pattern. And what we do is we compare our image with this face pattern and we attempt to say with some degree of confidence that we believe there is a face present in the image and if so we attempt to identify the location of the face inside of that image so implementing this histogram of oriented gradients approach facilitates the detection of a face in an image at this point, let's transition over to Python and let's start to implement some of this facial recognition theory into code and put this into practice. Before we do that, however, I do want to mention that the code we'll be exploring in this lecture is largely derived from my colleague Adrian Rosebrock's tutorials that are available on his website. So if you head over to pyimagesearch.com, he has a wealth of information and step-by-step -step tutorials that will walk you through a variety of applications. So in this lecture, we'll be pulling largely from his facial detection tutorial here on his website, pyimagesearch.com. Let's begin by opening an anaconda prompt. I'll then activate my environment. So for me, it's activate by Steve. 
And let's enter Python to confirm we have the proper version of OpenCV installed. So I'll import CV2. I'll then type CV2 dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore. And it looks like I have version 4.2 on my machine. So that's good. Recall we'll need OpenCV version 3.3 or greater. And let's also import arg parse. We'll be learning about arg parse today such that we can add multiple arguments into our command line calls using Python. Before we get started, head over to the module for today's lecture and download the prototext and cafe model files into the active directory you're using for Python. From here, let's open a new Python script and let's get coding. So here I'll type facial detection, then import the packages we'll be using today. So I'll import numpy as np, import arg parse, import opencv, so that'll be an import cv2, and let's just confirm that all packages are importing properly. So I'll add a print line statement here. I'll then go ahead and save my file in my working directory and I'll save that as facial detection dot pi and since I'm using notepad here I'll make sure to change that to all files so that it is saved as a Python file and then inside of my anaconda prompt go ahead and type Python facial detection dot pi and hit enter good looks like all of the packages are importing properly so let's head back over to our Python script. Since all the packages imported properly, I'll delete that print statement. And now I want to go ahead and define the inputs that I'll be using with the arg parse functionality. So I know I'm going to be inputting images, I'm going to be inputting the prototex and cafe models. So let's go ahead and begin by defining some of these inputs. I'll define AP equals arg parse, A-R-G-P-A-R-S-E dot argument parser, capital A, capital P. That'll define our argument parser. And within AP, let's add an argument. So we'll say AP dot add underscore argument. Quotes here, that'll be a dash I for image. We'll also accept a dash dash image. Both of those will be acceptable on the command line. We'll say required equals true. The user must enter that information. And let's give the user some details on what the argument is looking for. We'll, so we'll say help equals path to input image. So this argument then defines the location of the image that we want to pass through our facial recognition algorithm. Let's verify that we've correctly added an argument to this argument parser. We'll type args equals vars, V-A-R-S, left parenthesis, AP dot parse underscore args, left right parenthesis, and end that with a right parenthesis. And then let's go ahead and print that argument to the screen. So we'll type print args, left bracket, image, right bracket, and end that with a right parenthesis. So let's head over to our terminal. We'll say python facial detection dot pi, and then we'll add in that argument. So we'll type dash i and the name of an image file. Here I have an image file named testudo.jpg in my active working directory. I hit enter and it looks like we have successfully printed that argument to the screen. Let's continue by adding in the additional arguments that we will use for this detection algorithm. So I'll head back into my script and make some room here. And then let's continue. So I'll type AP dot add underscore argument. This argument will be dash P or dash dash proto text. It will be required by the user. So I'll type required equals true. And then to identify this argument, we'll type help equals path to cafe D 
deploy prototext. So that will define then the argument for that prototext file. We'll continue with our next argument. We'll type ap.add underscore argument again and dash m for model. We'll also accept dash dash model. This will also be required to be entered by the user. So we'll type required equals true. And then the help for this input will be path to cafe pre-trained model. Our last argument here will be the confidence. So we'll type ap.add underscore argument dash c for confidence. We'll also accept dash dash confidence. We'll give this a type equal to float. This can be any number between zero and one. We'll default that number at 0 0.5. Since this is not required equals true, we'll have a default number of 0 0.5 for the confidence in the event the user does not enter a confidence number. And then the help will be defined as a minimum probability to filter weak detections. Let's go down into our print statement now and let's rerun the file and print all of the arguments input by the user. So we'll head back over to our Anaconda prompt and let's add input arguments for the image, prototype, and model. So we'll type python facial detection.py dash i for image and the argument will be testudo.jpg. We'll type dash p for prototext and we'll give that input the deploy.prototext.txt. We'll then add a dash m for model. That'll be the res 10 underscore 300 by 300 underscore SSD underscore iter for iterations underscore 140,000 dot cafe model and go ahead and hit enter. We see then that we have printed all of the input arguments along with the confidence. Although we did not specifically define confidence, that default value was 0 0.5. So let's rerun this command line call. We'll type dash C and let's give it a value of 0 0.8 and hit enter. And we see that we have correctly printed the arguments input using argparse. Let's continue modifying our script. We'll add a path to load our model from disk. So let's let the user know that that process is occurring. So we'll type here, print quote loading model. And then let's define that model. So we'll come down and type net equals cv2 dot dnn for deep neural network dot read net from cafe with a capital N, capital F, capital C. And we'll feed to that model the arguments contained in prototext and model. Let's continue by defining a path to load the input image collect the dimensions of that input image and to create a blob. So we'll type image equals cv2.imread and we'll pass the argument defining the image location to that imread call. Let's extract the dimensions of the image. So we'll type height comma width h comma w is equal to image dot shape left bracket colon to right bracket. And let's create the blob. So we'll type blob equals cv2.dnn.blob from image. And the arguments we'll feed here will be cv2.resize. So we'll resize that input image. And we'll give that dimensions of 300 by 300. We'll also enter in a 1.0, 300, 300 defining the blob. And then the parameters 104.0, 177.0, and 123.0. If you're interested in reading more about the blob functionality, head back over to Adrian's Pi Image Search website, scroll down and click on this blog post link. 
That'll detail the dnn.blob from image function. Let's continue by applying face detection then. So we'll pass the blob through the network and let's let the user know that we're at that stage of the algorithm. So we'll type print computing object detections and we'll define net.setInput and we'll pass blob through that set input. And then we'll define our detections equal net.forward. Let's go ahead and print the result of this detection. So we'll print detections.shape and rerun our script in our Anaconda prompt. From here, it is apparent that the detection algorithm has made 200 possible detections, each with their own level of confidence. So let's define a for loop here where we'll look at each detection and we'll compare it to a minimum threshold defined by a particular confidence level. So here I'll type for i in range zero comma detections dot shape of two. Recall that was a value of 200. We'll extract the confidence level from each detection. So we'll say confidence equals detections. Left bracket, zero comma zero comma I comma two right bracket. And then let's go ahead and compare that confidence of detection with our threshold set in argparse. So we're going to filter out any of these weaker detections. We'll say if confidence greater than args of confidence, you recall that defaults to 0.5, that can of course be changed by the user. If that confidence is greater than the threshold, then we'll define the box that bounds the area defining a face. So we'll say B box for bounding box equals detections, left bracket zero comma zero comma I, three colon seven, and we'll multiply that by a NumPy array. So we'll say multiplied by np.array of width comma height comma height comma width, width and height both defined when we cv2.im read in the image. And then let's define our starting and ending x and y points. So we'll say start x comma start y comma end x comma end y. And that'll be equal to bbox.as type, and that'll be an integer since we're dealing with integer pixel values. If we've made a detection, let's go ahead and draw that bounding box and print the confidence level to the screen. So we'll define text equals quote left curly bracket colon dot two F. So we'll print that confidence level to two decimal places. That'll all be a dot format of confidence times 100. We'll put that in percentage. And we'll set y equals start y minus 10 if start y minus 10 is greater than 10. Otherwise, or else, we'll say start y plus 10. That'll help define that starting y position for the confidence text. Let's draw a rectangle or a bounding box. So we'll do a cv2.rectangle. We'll draw it on image. We'll give it a starting x, starting y, as well as an ending x, ending y coordinate. Here we'll draw our boxes in red. And since we're in BGR space, that'll be 0, 0, 255. And we'll give the line thickness a value of 2. To place the text on the screen, we'll call cv2.putText. We'll put that text on the image. We'll use the string defined in text. We'll give it a starting X and Y value here. Let's define a font that'll be cv2.font underscore Hershey underscore simplex. Give it a scale factor of 0 0.45. We'll draw our text in blue here. So it'll be 255 comma zero comma zero and we'll define a thickness of two. 
Let's go ahead and show that image to the screen. So we'll type cv2.imshow, give it a caption. I'll call it detections here. And then let's have a cv2.wakey of zero such that we can look at the output for as long as we desire. So with our script written, let's head back over to our Anaconda prompt, hit the up arrow and run our script. And looks like we've made a detection, but our bounding box is significantly distorted here. So let's head back into our script and take a look at why we're getting that error. Looks like in my script where I define the bounding box, I currently have the numpy array as width comma height comma height comma width. That should of course be width comma height comma width comma height. So we'll go ahead and make that change, save the file and rerun. And that looks good. We've identified the main face in the image, drawn a bounding box and printed the associated confidence level. To highlight this need for a confidence level threshold, I've modified the code here to print the detection confidence level for each of the detections each time it goes through the loop. So on the image, I've set the threshold. You'll notice there's only one bounding box. But if we print the confidence level from the detections output, you see there's a host of detections with significantly less detection probability. So let's update our code to now draw a bounding box for any detection above 1%. And now you'll notice, look how many faces, quote unquote, the detection algorithm believes it has detected, when of course there is only one true face in this image. With this in mind, let's take a look now at an image that has multiple faces present. I've gone ahead and added an import of imutils to my script here. And what we'll do now is we'll resize the image because I'm going to use a significantly larger image with multiple people, multiple faces in this image. And I'll go ahead and resize the width here to 1200. And if you notice now, I still have that confidence level threshold, but now I'm able to detect the presence of, in this case, five different faces in the image. Now the bounding box and the text for each is rather small because the image is so large. When I ran this imutils.resize, some of that information is harder to see. So if you play around with the width call here, so we'll go from 1200 up to 2400, rerun that script, you'll see as we start to zoom in, you get that bounding box as well as the detection probability. So the same script then can be used to detect multiple faces in an image, provided that the confidence level of each face meets that minimum threshold for detection.